Imagine a world where you knew that you mattered and you belonged. The people cared about you because we were so darn good at listening to one another, no matter how different we are. That is what Sidewalk Talk is doing by putting listeners on sidewalks all over the world so that we can practice the art of connecting. Join me, founder and director Tracy Rubel, as I interview experts on the fine art of human connection and interview some of our volunteers who've been listening on the sidewalk and even some of the folks that we've listened to. And if you want to volunteer, consider joining us at sidewalk-talk.org. Ah, so you just come right into my living room because I feel like this conversation with Dr. Jamie Marriage feels like it's a living room conversation where we're old friends, but new friends. We used to write together, but we didn't spend a lot of time really getting to talk live. She is a prolific writer and a phenomenal writer. But my favorite thing about her is she really is transparent about her own stuff and her own healing journey and recovery process, which I think makes people feel really safe with her. But you'll have to tell me what you think. She is the author of seven books. So Dr. Jamie Merrick has written seven books on trauma and recovery. And she's also an internationally recognized trainer in the areas of trauma, addiction, EMDR therapy, yoga, expressive arts, and mindfulness. Her newest release is a revised and expanded edition of Trauma and the 12 Steps that came out in July of 2020. I really love her books because they have so much story in them. So they're fun to read while educational. So if trauma and addiction are in your field at all, in your mind's eye, go pick up the expanded edition of her book, Trauma and the 12 Steps because she has a voice that is so unique in this field. It just feels like, like the conversation we're going to have. You're sitting down in a living room having a conversation with her. So please welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Jamie Merrick. Jamie Merrick, how many years ago did we sort of meet because you co-wrote pieces and we published them and kind I of, yes. how long was that? <laughs> I believe it was circa 2015, 2016. Uh, a common friend, Rajani, put us in touch and yeah, we've had an online friendship since then. Your work is really, for me, whenever I read your posts, there's a, an activist quality because there's a vibrancy that comes through and it feels like you're, you're trying to get us to get something collectively in the mental health field that we're not trying to get. Am I reading that right? Like if you have a mission and a platform and you're trying to educate us all, what is that thing that you're trying to get across to the rest of us? That we have to pay attention to trauma. I, I recently said to a friend the other day, and, and I'm not happy to admit this, that one of the reasons I have a company which is largely based on training and education, and we obviously have a big advocacy streak in my writing. And one of the reasons we exist is because most avenues of graduate education are not doing their job about trauma. And I don't mean this to be a universal put down of all graduate education, because I know I got a lot of the basics in mine, and some are really getting more enlightened about the role of trauma. But I know in my experience and the experience of so many people that I train, uh, we come out of graduate work with very little on trauma, on advocacy, on <sighs> even the reality of injustice as a traumatic issue. So if I have one mission that drives me, it's... We have to learn what trauma is, how it affects the human experience, how it shows up in various circles of life and venues in life, and to be able to address it at very least by doing no harm or minimizing further harm and hopefully coming up with proactive solutions to helping people heal from this legacy and impact of trauma. So I guess before going further, since I've pretty much declared that that is my mission and that is what drives me, uh, I want to share my working definition of trauma, which is wound. I was just going to ask you, how yes. did you read my mind? Yeah, oh, we're in sync, Tracy. So trauma comes from the Greek translation meaning wound. 
uh, in a nuanced translation, it specifically means a wound that can be healed. And so whenever we talk about trauma, one of the first things I want to make sure professionals and the general public can do is get past any misconceptions you may have that trauma equals only PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, that trauma only results if you've been to war or if you've been brutalized by war, even as a civilian, that trauma is not just if you've survived a natural disaster. Trauma is not just if you've survived a physical injury or accident. Uh, that trauma shows up in a lot of different ways in the human experience. And the easiest way to think of it is it's the wounds that don't get healed. And the thing with wounds is, yes, they come in all shapes and sizes. Some, if you think of what you know about physical wounding, some may have more serious implications for needing to get medical attention. Some may be more immediately life-threatening than others. But even a quote-unquote small wound that remains unhealed and unaddressed can continue to fester and infect. And if the person is not in optimal conditions for healing, then what may seem like a small wound on the outside can actually be something quite significant. So when I'm asked for my working definition of trauma as a humanitarian, as a human being, my first definition, it's any unhealed wound. And of course, I can talk all of the clinical finesse if I need to in those, ven in those circles or in those avenues, but if we're keeping it simple, trauma is an unhealed wound or a series of unhealed wounds. So if I hear you correctly, there's a particular way then that somebody might come into a psychotherapist's office with trauma, but because that therapist hasn't gotten the exposure or training to work with that particular kind of unhealed wound, what happens for the client, for the person that's coming in, hoping that they're going to be helped? Like, what is the legacy that that leaves if we're not getting that education? Well, I think two things can happen. And, and first of all, it's not necessarily all on the therapist in that the culture that we live in, especially Western culture, has tended to put a lot of this quick fix mentality even on how we heal, right? That many people I've seen over the years have come in and just think that an instant medication will heal them or fix them or cure them because that's a lot of what's marketed to them, right? Is, is the instant cure for craziness. And it often, I mean, it doesn't exist <laughs> to be quite frank. And I'm not an anti-medication type of therapist, but I am very concerned about this over-tendency that the medical model has to diagnose and medicate people. And I think that's what a lot of people who are coming in for help may expect, or quite frankly, may want. Because then once we start exploring trauma, at least this is in, in my office, a lot of people can get frightened when they realize, wow, to truly heal this, I actually have to do some emotional work. Can I just take a pill? So that's, that's part of, I think, the influence of consumer culture on even a lot of the folks who are legitimately suffering that, that come to see us. But where, where therapists can, and I think do go wrong, uh, are clinicians of all stripes, is that if they're not really trained to look at the reality of trauma, how it plays out in the body, how it plays out in the human experience, and especially if they're working on old notions about what PTSD or trauma is, they may not even consider it as a viable diagnosis. And so while I don't doubt that diagnoses that are often called things like bipolar disorder or ADHD or schizophrenia can exist and do exist, a lot of times they either exist comorbid with trauma or they've been exacerbated because of unhealed trauma or what we're really looking at is a more complex manifestation of post-traumatic stress disorder or dissociative disorders. And a lot of the symptoms can overlap. So if a clinician of any kind is not really trained to look at what the diagnoses have in common and the role that unhealed trauma can play in how certain diagnoses show up, and even substance abuse disorders, uh, which are their own diagnosis or diagnoses in the DSM, uh, but unhealed trauma, the more we're studying and learning about it, plays a tremendous role in the causality and in the progression of those disorders uh, or those uh, problems, if you don't like the word disorder, because sometimes I'm, I'm on the fence about that word. I use it because I am a clinician who works in the field and I'm expected to in a lot of circles, but 
fundamentally, I, I believe so much of what we're seeing is the legacy of unhealed trauma. You know, what you just shared brought to mind a story for me. Um, I'm now living here in Germany with my family and my two young sons. And when my young sons arrived, they now go to a German language school. Hmm. And that's a heavy load for kids, right? Right. And one son exhibits some, some, some symptoms of wiggliness, of hyperactivity, of being a kinesthetic learner. And when we went in to meet with the teacher, because um, they found him on the roof of school. <laughs> mm, wow. He's acting out. And I explained to her, I said, well, I can give you some academic history on him, but there's also some trauma. And I said, you know, when he was five, he was jumping on a bed at a friend's house and he jumped out the second story window and landed on the driveway down below. And so his nervous system, we really have to take care of his nervous system. And she had zero capacity to hear that. She wanted to do mm. exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. She wanted him to go to a doctor and get some kind of pill to get him to behave. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you know, and right. so I, my question for you is, can, in fact, getting treatment sometimes exacerbate the trauma if you end yes. up seeing someone that does shit like that? <laughs> that was an enthusiastic yes. <laughs> I heard the yes, and my, as the mom and me is like going, thank God, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, I've heard so many tales like that uh, where people have been through a variety of centers and doctors and hospitals and have been given almost every diagnosis in the DSM, but it's not actually been looked at as trauma. And that brings to mind a, a story I often share in my teaching. It's a personal friend of mine's story who's given me permission, um, that she was treated with medication. First, it was ADHD when she was a child, then it became bipolar disorder when she was an adult up until her early 30s. And she also had an addiction issue on top of that, becoming addicted to cocaine. And she knew that it had something to do with abuse she experienced as a child, but there was never a real willingness to go there. And at one point she was on six different medications and told, you just have to accept you have bipolar and this is your, your way of living. And so she decided one day in her 30s, and I'm not advocating that people do this, to be clear, but this is what she did, that she just took herself off of all medication to say, let's see what I am underneath all of this. And she developed a pretty stringent yoga and meditation practice, started eating better, and improved pretty significantly. And I met her when she moved back to Ohio, where I live, and she's a, a childhood friend. And at that point, just as her personal friend who happened to be a trauma specialist, I showed her the PTSD diagnosis as we were talking about everything she had been through. And she had tears in her eyes with this proclamation of, why has nobody ever shown me this diagnosis? Because this actually fits to what I've experienced. And even in the very vanilla PTSD diagnosis in the DSM, uh, particularly under the criterion that talks about hyperarousal and reactivity, we have symptoms there like poor concentration, difficulty falling or staying asleep, kind of having this zero to 60 anger response that can often get labeled as bipolar acting out. Uh, reckless or self-destructive behavior can be part of that. So again, a lot of these symptoms can show up in other diagnoses that I think are quite frankly easier to give because the implication is, well, let's put them on a medication. Whereas if you really are looking at any trauma-based disorder, because here's, here's Tracy, one of the criticisms I get. Oh, Jamie, if, if you say that trauma is in everything, then everybody's going to blame their stuff on trauma and everybody's going to say they have PTSD or something similar. Here's, here's the issue, though. PTSD, even PTSD, is not an easy, quote-unquote, diagnosis to have because there's no one pill you can take that's going to alleviate most of the symptoms. Uh, I mean, there's some indications that certain medications can help with certain PTSD symptoms, uh, like some of the nightmares, or even some of the mood symptoms respond well to SSRIs. But to truly eradicate and heal the PTSD or any other trauma-related disorder, you have to do work, <laughs> like therapeutic work. Uh, to Raising feel, my hand, girl. Yes, to actually feel the impact of this in your body and in your emotions and move it through. 
Uh, and that is not easy. I'm not saying by any means that that's easy. It's certainly not as appealing to people who might be ensconced in quick fix culture, right? <laughs> uh, but it is the way that we can fundamentally heal this and, and really bring about change and end suffering in the world. I feel very strongly about that. Uh, but that can be a hard sell for, for clients, even clients who, who come in because they're feeling poorly. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that just really represents a lot of what I believe, what I've personally experienced in my own story, and what I try to get out there as an advocate. Well, you bring up uh, where I wanted to go next. I mean, you're so passionate about this. I can hear it the way you talk mm -hmm. about it and how much, you, you know, how much you've written about this. And mm -hmm. why? What about your story had you get really motivated to start educating the rest of us about the role trauma is playing in our well-being? Because there was an amazing person who crossed my path who saw it in me and really course corrected my life, if I'm being quite, quite honest about it. So I got into this field totally through the back door. When I was an undergrad, my majors were in history and American Studies, which was a subset of the English department at my school. So I basically have a pop culture degree, which is fun, and I, I'm glad I got that basis. But uh, I had thought I was going to go on and do graduate work and PhD in some kind of humanities. And what ended up happening was in 2000, I essentially moved to Eastern Europe on a whim. Uh, my family's from Croatia, so I was always raised with a pretty strong adherence to Croatian culture, and, and I still have uh, extended cousins that live in Croatia. Just, just a, a plug. That's our family's yeah. favorite place to go on vacation. Just so you it's, know. <laughs> it's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful country. So as a quick current events reminder, there was a civil war in the countries of the former Yugoslavia, which included Croatia in 91 to 95. And I followed what was going on intently because I had family there and I was interested in history. And I actually spent a couple summers studying there after travel was, was safer again. And so in 2000, really motivated by my own life being in the toilet, if I could be frank about it, uh, I had a full-blown alcohol and drug problem by the time I was 20, 21. Uh, I had a lot of other mental health issues going on, and I wasn't able to get help at home. Um, I, I have the, the, a typical story of my, my parents did the best they could with what they had, but that also meant a lot of the pick themselves up, but pick yourself up by the bootstraps type of mentality or just go to church and you'll be fine. And I had tried those things and was still in very much a suffering place. So kind of not knowing what to do, I said, let me go to Europe. Let me go to Croatia and teach English because I had enough Croatian language at that point And I just knew I could kind of hang out there. <laughs> and so uh, it, it ended up, it, at the time, it was a geographical cure. Uh, let's move 8,000 miles away from all these things that are bothering me in the U.S. I had dropped out of my first graduate program. And I ended up working in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is, and Herzegovina is the Croatian enclave of Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina. So I ended up working for a pretty well-known Catholic parish there that had a really big aid organization and outreach. And I started teaching English at a children's home and I was still drinking pretty intently, although I had stopped drug use when I moved there. And probably after living in the country and working there for about eight months, uh, there was a wonderful American woman named Janet Leff who moved to, to Croatia in her retirement. Uh, she had been a social worker in the U.S. She had engaged in aid runs during the Civil War. She had come to the country 12 times. And in her retirement, she felt led by, by her own personal spiritual path to move there long term and to help with some aid work and to get treatment started, uh, alcoholism treatment started in, in Croatia and Bosnia. She had been sober herself about 25 or 26 years at that point. And the cool thing is, is that she's from Ohio. She was from Ohio, where I'm from. You're kidding uh, me. That is 40, crazy. 45 minutes away, we lived in the U.S. She uh, passed in 2017. So that's why I'm using past yeah. tense. Um, and yeah, we, we met there. And she, she was just a classic example of somebody who lived the message of her own spiritual path, her own recovery program, never tried to tough love me or anything of that nature. She was just a good woman who I got to know very well. 
And my first exposure to anything recovery related was to go and translate a meeting for her. It wasn't a 12 step meeting, but it was more of like a, like a county council on alcoholism meeting. And I, I was not a professional translator there, but I was good in a pinch. So she didn't have a translator available to her that day. And I went. And when they were talking about addiction and alcoholism, a lot just resonated for me <laughs> about my own experience. And uh, about a month later, I, I hit another real bad patch with, with using drugs again, and I knew I could talk to her. She just made that impression that I could talk to her. And when I did, she met me very much from this place of, Jamie, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just an alcoholic, and that's good news. <laughs> And I asked her why that was good news. And she said, because there's treatment. We know what to do about it. And at that point, I just thought I had a crazy head. And, you know, give me that pill or give me that lobotomy or whatever right. it would be. And so she recommended uh, counseling and, and going to 12-step to meetings. And we didn't have access to very many at that point. And uh, she kind of worked as both my sponsor and my counselor in those early days, which is unconventional, but it's what we had to work with back there. And then a few months into me trying to go to meetings is when she witnessed me have a pretty major traumatic reaction. Uh, my, my superior was, was this Franciscan priest, who was a wonderful man, to be clear. Um, and I am still in touch with him. But he, he had said something to me at work one day that set off a reaction. And it was the type of reaction where I was just crying and melting down, and he didn't know what to do with me. So he called Janet. And she came in to work and to the office I was working at that day. And she got me and she took me home and she put me to bed, put a cold compress on my head. And she even told father when, when she took me away, she, he, she said, this is traumatic. This is not just a girl overreacting. Like, I, I got this. I'll handle it. And at that point is when she talked to me about trauma. And I had never thought that applied to me because my association was you had to go to Vietnam to even have PTSD right. at, at that point. And she helped me to understand that wars take on different shapes and sizes, right? That you can go to a physical conflict or the war zone can be your house. The war zone can be your neighborhood. Right. The war zone could be the country you're living in in quote unquote peacetime. Uh, you know, just look at what's happening in the U.S. right now for evidence of that. And Janet, she was so ahead of her time. Uh, I, I always say she was trauma informed before it was cool, before we were mm. even talking. About, and that, and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm glad it's cool. I'm glad we're talking about it more now. Uh, but she was just a good old school social worker who understood, who understood the fundamentals of trauma. And, you know, Tracy, when people ask me why I do the work I do, why I write the books I write, my hope is that anybody seeking help, especially anybody with an addiction or a compulsivity issue seeking help, has the experience like I had with Janet that she was the perfect combination of compassionate while also being challenging. Yeah. Because I think sometimes we can emphasize the, ch the compassion too much and we don't give people a plan of accountability or give them actual constructive steps they can take. Yeah. And I've seen on the other side of that coin, people emphasize the tough love and the action too much. And that's when you end up shutting people down. And the, the piece of, of wisdom she gave me that, changed my life and I believe really drives the work I do is after listening to my story she said Jamie after everything you've been through I'm not surprised you turned out alcoholic so what now wow. like what are you going to do about it now and so it was always this beautiful blend Tracy of validation followed by challenge mm -hmm. and that's the type of clinician that I am today inspired by her and that's what I, I try to get out there as an advocate mm. Gosh, I just feel like I'm sitting in the room with Janet right now. Oh, yeah. As you, as you talk about her, I can get, um, I feel a real sense of how much you loved her and how much yes. she really advocated for you. So thank you for bringing us into that world a little bit. I appreciate that, Jamie. You're so welcome. All the work I do is truly in her honor. Yeah. Well, I have a question for you. Sure. So, you know, I, I'm a therapist. Mm -hmm. And... I even still ask myself this question, even though I have some trauma training. So I'm going to get some good consultation from you while interviewing Go for it. the podcast. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> what is best practices for working with folks with trauma? What are the folks missing that, that, and what techniques or 
theoretical models would you yeah. wish more clinicians were trained in? Yeah. Well, I guess let me qualify it. Well, let me answer your question first, and then we can go more into the specifics of techniques. Trauma-informed care, trauma-focused treatment has to involve the whole self, has to involve the body, and has to be what folks like Dan Siegel and Bessel van der Kolk would really call bottom-up care as opposed to top-down care. Because top-down care, meaning like the top of the brain, the more cognitive area of the brain down, emphasizes modalities that are more cognitive in nature, self-knowledge in nature, psychoeducational in nature, and those are not all bad to be clear, but that's mostly how we're trained in graduate school uh, for, for the most part. And if we're using the wound metaphor, top-down treatments are like putting a Band-Aid on the wound. You need the Band-Aid, to be clear. You may need to stabilize the wound, but in order for the wound to truly heal, we have to be using treatments and modalities and approaches that help people heal from the bottom up, which is more experiential healing, uh, which is more not what are you thinking and let's challenge the thinking, but what are you feeling and inviting a person to actually be with the feeling or be with the body sensation because that's ultimately how unhealed trauma plays out. Uh, so I, I always recommend that anybody interested in this have a cursory understanding of the triune brain model or the hand model of the brain to really understand what's done by meant by top down or bottom up. And Dan Siegel has a lot of good teaching videos on that. So in terms of specific modalities, um, really anything that gets a person into their body and emotions, as opposed to just their, their words and their thoughts. So obviously I have my favorites. Um, I am a mindfulness and a yoga teacher in addition to being a, a clinician. But for me, the reason I pursued meditation and pursued yoga was to be a better clinician and not only to enhance my own self-care, but then once I really saw the gift of meditation and yoga, I pursued training in it myself, and I now integrate that into my clinical life, and it's also a big part of what I teach. Because mindfulness and yoga, despite what a lot of, here I am, knocking popular culture again. Like if you go on Google Images right yeah, now I, and search. The image of McMindfulness yeah. is coming into yeah. my mind right now. Totally. Hearing, oh, God, Jamie, don't do the McMindfulness no. route on me. Oh, trust me, I'm far from McMindfulness. Because one thing, one thing I say in my teachings, right, is if you go on Google Images right now and you search mindfulness, what typically comes up is a perfect white woman sitting underneath a tree on a beach in a like beautiful meditative position, right? Or you might see a lotus on a pond or a rock. And my favorite picture of mindfulness is me holding the poop emoji, to be quite honest. Yes, or that video a, that was viral that's like, let that fucking yes, shit go. Yes, exactly. That, that mindfulness and yoga as practices are really about teaching us to be with, with what is. We don't have to like it. We don't have to ex insert expletive like it. But but the practices, I, I think the biggest misconception about them is that they're relaxation techniques or that with yoga, it's just another way to exercise. And it's not. Like when you really get into the depth of the practices, um, which can be easily accessible, to be honest, as long as you know what the depths of those practices are, right? Um, they have wonderful clinical application because they help me teach my clients. They help me teach myself this thing we call distress tolerance. And part of what distress tolerance is, is that you're able to kind of ride the waves of life as they come. It doesn't mean you have to like what life is bringing you. And in fact, not liking what life brings you might inspire you into some kind of change. But at least you're doing it from that place of knowing and awareness. So I really like a, a metaphor used by John Kabat-Zinn when he says, mindfulness is not about making the waves stop. It's about learning how to surf. As so somebody who's a surfer, I, I totally get that. And cool. I have to interrupt you for a second. I am, Do it. I am piss poor at sticking to my mindfulness practice, though. And I'm going to bet you money that there's uh -huh. a gazillion people listening to this right now going, yeah, mindfulness makes me feel better, but I can't freaking stay accountable to the practice. Yeah. Do you have any, any tips or tricks? I do. Yeah, give it to I, us. I, I think part of it is realizing that mindfulness is not just sitting meditation. Uh, I mean, I, I lead a program called Dancing Mindfulness, where Ooh, we use like it. dance and we use music listening as a way to promote mindful awareness. Um, I always tell a client, if you're interested in starting a mindfulness practice, pick one thing you do with regularity every day, even if it's something as mundane as brushing your teeth. 
And can you make a commitment to do that with full attention and awareness for two to three minutes? And brushing the teeth is a hard one for me because I'm picking up my clothes or checking my phone. I'm not staying focused on it. And so pick something you do in your daily life and turn it into a mindfulness practice, even if you can't stay disciplined about sitting. Um, so like when people ask me what my mindfulness or my yoga practice looks like, honestly, it differs day to day, but it is consistent. And I also try to work with people on consistency is better for the brain than inconsistency. So even if you can do something mindfully five minutes a day, it's better than doing nothing and a big 35 minute sit on the weekend or going to a good yoga class on the weekend. I mean, if you can still do the yoga class on the weekend, do it. But those little pockets we spend each day, because I think a lot of people beat themselves up if they can't give themselves the full 25, 30 minutes. Like, oh, I missed yeah. my practice today. I'm not with it. So go with the little pockets that, that you can. And that is fundamentally better for your brain and better for life. Uh, another Janet story I can tell about Ooh, yeah, that more Janet. Since, since we talked about her. So she was a big believer in put something in your path that will remind you. Uh, so when we started working 12 step, uh, material together, she encouraged that I pray every morning. Um, I, I still had a faith in some kind of God at that point. So praying was not a deal breaker for me, but I told her, Janet, I'm not a morning person. Like I'm lucky if I can roll out of bed, go to the bathroom and then get to work. <laughs> and she said, Oh, you go to the bathroom. And I said, yeah. <laughs> no, no. So what I she, love where this is going. This is so great. what she did was she gave me a little meditation reader. We call it the 24 hour book and 12 step programs. It's like one of those little daily reader type type of things, a page a day. And she said, put this on your toilet seat and leave it there. Because that way on your when toilet you toilet seat. Yes. Like literally so it serves dual purpose. Not only yes. does it put that in your path, it gets you to close your toilet seat. Yes. <laughs> That's a good point. So that was her directive was to literally put it on the toilet seat because she said then if, you ha if you're using your toilet to go to the bathroom, you're picking up the book. And whether it's first thing in the morning or last thing at night, you're, you're, you're reading the meditation or rereading it. And she said, just try it for a month. And Tracy, that was the practice that started me into some kind of daily morning routine. This is with, genius. This with, is prayer, with prayer yeah. meditation. Yeah. This and is and even now, almost 18 years later into recovery, I, I have to read something spiritual every morning. I don't have to keep it on my toilet seat anymore. I, I guess sometimes <laughs> I put it on my toilet back. Um, I, I keep my, the current reader I'm working through is by my bedside. But it's just so automatic like I, that I have to read something, just a page that, that's spiritual in the morning. And that puts me into the routine with my prayers and some breath and some days I have more time than others for morning practice, but I do yeah. at least that five minutes, which was inspired by her toilet seat. So she would tell people all the time, if you wear glasses, put your glasses like under the bed. So you may have to get on your knees and that would remind you to pray. Post-it notes. Now with cell phones, because we didn't have smartphones in that era, you can set reminders for yourself. But I, I was really inspired by her directive to put something in your path. And to go to our original discussion here about what helps with trauma, it's action action is going to do it. These, these things that we do that can teach our brain that things can be different as opposed to just saying and, and thinking. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, she was all about talking things out too and feeling your feelings while you did that and active listening. But she was always like, what are you going to do now? Yeah. It, it always had some kind of action to be taken. So yeah, I think whatever specific modality a therapist is using that Part of trauma-focused care has to be getting people into daily routine, mm -hmm. um, however that may work. Um, as I think you know, I'm an EMDR, I'm movement desensitization and reprocessing therapist mm -hmm. and a trainer, and uh, it is my preferred clinical modality, but I, I don't think it's a panacea. There are other fine modalities out there that I, okay. I think are also getting to the core. Yeah, I want to give a give a shout out to sensory motor psychotherapy because yes. not because that's what I'm trained in. I'm not marketing myself because that's the kind of therapy I received that actually helped right. me with my own trauma. It's fabulous treatment, sensory motor, uh, a closely related somatic experiencing, or anything that's getting to the body, getting to the emotions, getting to the core, in in as gentle of a way as possible for people. I'm a fan of. Uh, but I'll tell you this: even the quick fix mentality we talked about at the beginning can happen in EMDR. Because uh, I'll have a lot of people come in for EMDR who read something about it online, 
Like I read that in two to three sessions, it'll cure me. <laughs> and a lot of that marketing that's out there about EMDR is very focused on single incident trauma. And yes, after two to three sessions, I can yeah. see a lot of my clients have significant relief. But when you're dealing with complex trauma or an addiction or substance use issue mixed in, it's still going to take some time. Yeah. And part of what that requires is for you to get into some daily lifestyle change routine in between your sessions. Uh, and this is where I wish I had 12-step programs to send a lot of my other clients to who don't necessarily qualify overtly for a 12-step program. Because that's one thing the 12 steps gave me in, through Janet's guidance was this kind of daily commitment that I, I have to do actionable steps every day in order to keep myself well or to keep myself on the path towards wellness. So, I mean, there's a lot of amazing modalities out there now that work with the body, but that also has to be combined with just something on a daily basis. Um, and to that, I cite Adler, you know, Alfred Adler, one of the oh, fathers yeah. of our field. I read yeah. a lot of his stuff when I was a new parent because he's, oh, yeah. parenting stuff is so helpful. He was actually the one who coined the term lifestyle in 1929. I didn't know that. And he defined lifestyle as the things we end up doing as a response to our own inferiority. <laughs> No, that's so great. I yes. love that. Isn't that a great teaching? Yeah, I, I've, I've cited him like all through my doctoral work and, and in, in the work I do. Because in looking, Tracy, at all the different programs and methods, and everybody has an opinion about what works best for healing addiction and substance use disorders. And when I was working on my doctorate, I read all of them because I really wanted to know what's the common thread here. And the common thread really was the importance of lifestyle change the importance of helping people mm. develop a healthier lifestyle. Mm. And so from that, I went to, well, where do we even get this word? So this is where the English teacher still serves me because I, uh -huh. I love you word I love word origin. Track it down. Yeah, and, and Adler was the one who coined it. And, and the metaphor he used was this, is that this inferiority that we experience in life <laughs> as a result of trauma or developmental wounding likely it, it, it's kind of like this pair of glasses through which we see the world. Mm -hmm. And he defined lifestyle change as getting a new prescription on your glasses. Mm. Or sometimes you just got to check out the old pair. Yeah. And try on a new pair of glasses. Yeah. Oh, that's so, well, I am making connections to sidewalk talk with what you just said. Marvelous. I'm glad to hear that. I, I'll tell you why. Can I, can I infuse mm -hmm. myself in this conversation infuse. a little bit? Infuse, yes. <laughs> I was reflecting on what's changed about me at Sidewalk Talk, and I think mm. for very to, to locate myself in, in this whole intersectional world, I was the first college grad in my family, mm. and so I think a lot of times I compensate for that by trying to be really smart and talking all the time and mm. not shutting my mouth, right? So what's happened is by practicing listening, it's relieved me of some of that tension of having to prove my worth, number one, but also radically delighting in other people's stories and how much more I could savor the quality of the connection when I wasn't so self-obsessed with whether I was a worthwhile person yes. or smart enough. And it was through the shift in my lifestyle through practicing listening and centering the voice of another human and their story rather than mine, mm. that has really changed me, frankly, more than if I'd finger wagged myself into, you should just talk about yourself less. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. So I really, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of having an aha moment with you live in real time right now. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. And a word I'm hearing for you there is shift. And I believe that is fundamentally the core of trauma healing is to shift. Uh, when people ask me point blank how EMDR works, my simple elevator pitch explanation is it shifts how memories are stored in the brain. And I mean, I won't oh, go I into the that. whole, yeah, I won't go into the whole neuroscience behind that, but every Every real trauma-focused modality, sensory motor, uh, somatic experiencing, shifts how memories are stored in the brain. It's not about making memories go away. It's shifting how they're stored so that we can be in the world differently. And when I think about what real change is, it's, it's a shift. It's a shift in how we relate with life, how we relate with ourselves, how we see the world. And that ultimately causes 
the needed shifts we need to have with others and in our life. That's beautiful. Well, I'm going to bring in this other piece too, because there is in a way a social justice aspect to us collectively working on our trauma. I, I'm going to be a little soapboxy for a second. You down with no, that? I'm down. <laughs> you know, I know for me as a white person, when I work on my own nervous system, it enables me to create justice for others who have less privilege than me. So actually working on my trauma is part of my justice work. Otherwise, I'm going to infuse conversations about justice with my own hyper arousal or my own need to be seen or my own need to be soothed by a person of color, right? And so... Again, I, I can't say that I premeditated this before you and I got on this conversation, but it's, it's just in the context that we're having this conversation. What I've been really mindful of the last 72 hours is how important it has been for me to regulate my nervous system so that when I show up in the world, it isn't all about me. <laughs> Good way and, to look at it. Yeah. So I'm just really appreciating how this quality of changing our lifestyle is part of any sort of activism that we take up in the world. Cause it's hard. Activism is hard. It's, it's impacts the body and it impacts our time and, and everything else. So, it, and yeah. I do believe healing our trauma is the most radical act we can engage in. And as particularly if through our own healing, we're inspired to pass it forward to others not to fix or to change them, but to be what that person may need in the world to help them heal their trauma as well. Um, Ooh, say I, that again. To oh, be, I don't know. We may have to rewind it. To <laughs> Just be kind of. what that person needs in the world. Yeah. I love that. We have healed our trauma. We can show up for other people, not to fix or to change, but, but to be what they need us to be. Uh, in in this experience of healing. Ah, that's so good. So part of my soapbox about what's going on in, in the world right now, if we can rewind back to COVID, I mean, we're still in COVID and, and, and the crisis surrounding it, but I wrote a piece at the beginning of it, really kind of calling us to take the same level of urgency we've had about COVID to looking at trauma and abuse and addiction. Because don't get me wrong, I am all for taking precautions about spreading physical contaminants, right? But it's, 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 the say, it's the sense of like, well, because the physical body is involved, we're tending to take it more seriously than what happens with people's emotional bodies mm. every day. Mm. And going back to the trauma as wound metaphor, if wounds remain untreated, they bleed, and we bleed all over people as a result. So oh, that's I know, good. I know many of us have heard this axiom that hurt people hurt people, which I, I tend to believe because of the trauma as wound metaphor. Um, and I heard this years ago from Stephanie Covington, uh, who was a leader in the addiction field and women's work, that in the physical healthcare system, we do our best to take universal precautions to spread or to mitigate the spread of bloodborne or other bodily fluids, because that's what how can disease can spread? So why aren't we getting that level of urgency and universal best precautions about trauma? Because we bleed all over each other when unhealed trauma <laughs> takes root. And you just have to look at any day of news content in the United States to see that, or most places in the world too. Yeah. Wow. My whole body's responding to everything you just said. That's, yeah. That's, wow, that's profound. Well, so I want folks to have access to more of your work because I know folks are going to hear this conversation and go, wow, I've got to learn more about this. So tell us about where people can find sure. you. And you've got a, a, a latest book out. It's not your first, but, I do. but tell us more. Because it's, I don't know, I want to celebrate your book because I feel like I haven't well, written a book yet and I feel like it's like giving birth. It's such a big yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. They, they, they all take on their own kind of character and personality like pets or children might. So, uh, so the easiest place to, to find my resources is a very simple page, traumamadesimple.com. So it's just www.traumamadesimple.com. 
And that's where you can get some information about my newest book, which is the revised and expanded edition of Trauma and the 12 Steps. So the original book came out in 2012, and this is a revised expanded edition with new content that addresses issues like social justice as a trauma-focused issue that the recovery community needs to be aware of. Uh, also on TraumaMadeSimple.com, I have accesses to all the recordings I've done online, like podcasts like this one. I'll probably put the link up on there. I do a lot of free content on YouTube, mindfulness skills, trauma-informed yoga skills. Uh, for EMDR therapists who may be listening, I do a lot of EMDR demos. So yeah, TraumaMadeSimple.com is the easiest place to, to find the resources. Uh, my personal page is just my name.com, jamiemarriage.com. If you're interested in the Dancing Mindfulness program, uh, Expressive Arts, we have dancingmindfulness.com. And then my company is called the Institute for Creative Mindfulness, and our website is instituteforcreativemindfulness.com. And we've taken a lot of our trainings and curriculums, even EMDR, online in the wake of what's happened with COVID. So if you want more to learn with me and study with me, I would recommend that website. Well, we'll put all those up in the, in the show notes, folks, so you don't have to like sweat it. <laughs> I, but I love, I think it's important for you to get to speak it because, you know, folks want to hear it, but don't freak out. If you're listening, you're on a walk right now, you can go back to the website and click the links there. Um, wow, this was really fun. Yes, I, just wanna, I just want to give context to everyone. Jamie and I have only ever spoken on email all these years <laughs> and yeah. Facebook. So this was really fun for us to get to see each other's faces for the first time and yes. voices. So I really salute you and the work that you do. And thank you for, in a way, touching my own life. Because I know for me, my own healing journey began when I began working with a sensory motor therapist who mm -hmm. really got me to get into my body as well. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy for your clients too and all the therapists that you train. Thank you, Tracy. I do think our Facebook friendship is a testament to that virtual life is a real thing and yeah. we can connect with people in many, many ways. And I, I believe that even before COVID-19 and I believe it even more now. Mm. Wonderful. Well, thanks for all the tips. This was really great. I Thank actually, you for I'm going to have to do the toilet thing. I have to be honest with you. <laughs> it's great. It's great. <laughs> Set reminders in your path. Yeah, I owe so much to that woman. So thank you for giving me the platform to talk about her. That's really sweet. All right. And yeah, just let me know when it's live and I'll share it around my sites. And again, thank you so much. I loved your questions. And your oh, guidance. good. It was fun. We had a fun, fun, fun dialogue. Fun vibe. Yep. <laughs> all so, right. Take care, Tracy. Bye. 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 Thank you for being here and listening to this episode of the Sidewalk Talk podcast. If you like what you heard, tell your friends, tell your family, like and comment on the podcast publisher that you're listening from and subscribe. This will help us get the word out about changing our culture to one of connection.